Well, we're going to continue our study in the story of God and man, and uh, we're going to, our theme verse today is Acts chapter 7, verse 44 through 50, which says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he has seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling, uh, dwelling for, God, for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in the temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Let's pray. Father, we come to you and thank you and praise you for the day. Lord, that you have gathered us together for worship and for exaltation of Christ. And Lord, for healing and for instruction and righteousness. And Lord, all the various things that you have gathered your people together for. Lord, we know that you have a specific plan and purpose for each one of us that are here today. And we know that there are those who are at home. and, And of course, we remember Billy and as he's not feeling well, but others who have stayed home or, or who are unable to make it or uh, for various reasons, Lord, that, that God, we know that you're ministering to them, Father, and, and through all the things that they encounter, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that, that you'd watch over them, watch over us, Lord, and bring us, God, into conformity to Christ, that we may bear his image in truth, Lord, and that we will walk in that, in that righteousness that is gifted to us, in him through the gospel. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, God has fulfilled his promise to Abraham to deliver Israel from the hand of their oppressors. Remember, he, in the covenant, he prophesied that they would be bound for 400 years. Now, he has judged Egypt for bringing Israel into bondage. And he has brought them, brought Israel into the wilderness and established his covenant with them to make them a special people unto himself. And he has even forgiven their immediate rebellion. And now, after this covenant is made, they, they must head to the promised land. But God intends to personally lead his people. And he must prepare them for this. And so that's what we're going to look at today is how God will be in the presence of his people. We're going to look at the tabernacle and the temple and some other things. So we begin uh, looking at the tabernacle of the wilderness in Exodus 25. Now, in our narrative, we've already gone past this, so we're backing up a little bit. Um, And so um, we want to look then at some of the things that, that God has said and done in regards to the tabernacle. It says in Exodus 25, verse 1 and following, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and the stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall surely overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. That's important. That's how you transport the ark. The poles should be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. 
and you shall put it into the ark of the testimony which I give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered wood you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of, it, of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat in their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be, bow, shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, and between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Now, this is an important piece of the narrative. In, the, in, our, in our biblical narrative from beginning to end because this is a description of the, the way that God will dwell with his people uh, as they enter into the promised land. It's a tabernacle, a sanctuary, a tent of meeting. A sanctuary is mikdash. It means consecrated thing or holy place. The tabernacle is mishkan. It means dwelling place or residence. And then there's two words, ohel and moed, a tent of meeting. And this is a place where Israel will meet with God. So this is very important in Israel's journey. And of course, it's mobile. In other words, they can go, it, it goes where they go. And, uh, and so uh, the important part of the tabernacle, and there's all kinds of things that we can talk about when we talk about the tabernacle, but one of the major important issues that we need to discuss is that in some sense, the tabernacle is the dwelling place of God on earth. Now, it's not the permanent, as we see in our text from Acts 7. It's not a permanent dwelling place. It doesn't contain God, but it is a residence, if you will. And it provided God a, a, a way for God to be present with his people, uh, but in an in a interesting way. Because if you'll notice, and, and I, man, I had a hard time finding a copyright free, uh, a free copyright law. I mean, no. Uh, slide. But anyways, uh, if you'll notice that there's a, a major little uh, section right here. This is the actual area where the priest goes in and, the, and all the, the praying and the incense and the light all happens. And then back here is the Holy of Holies. And this is where the sacrifices take place. Well, this is where God's going to be. This is where the cloud's going to be in, the, in, the, in the, the tabernacle. And so what we're going to see is that basically... God's uh, 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 tabernacle gave him a way to move with his people or be present to his people. And here is the tabernacle's arrangement of how they, they actually had a certain order in which they camped around the tabernacle. And, and again, this is the outer court, then you go into the Holy of Holies, and this is the holy place. And so uh, it, it made a way for God to be present in his holiness. Because there's, there's, you don't want God to just show up in his holiness. <laughs> you know? If he just shows up in his holiness, you're in trouble. Uh, and so uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 4 says, So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, talk about Moses, God called him from the midst of the bush, the burning bush, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Hold on. You're not prepared. You're not ready. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place that, where you stand is holy ground. So you've got to get prepared to meet the Lord. Think about this. Joshua 24, verse 19. Joshua says to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. What's the implication there? You're not holy. <laughs> For he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. God's not willy-nilly and forgiving. God is holy. And they couldn't just say, oh, yeah, we got, yeah God's our God. Oh, no, 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 no. You have to get rid of your false gods. Turn away from your idols. Make the Lord your God. 
And then if you forsake that, guess what? There's no forgiveness for that. He will consume you. He will do you harm. See, God wanted to be present with his people, but he knows what his presence entails, and he has to actually guard his people from him. He has to guard them from his holiness. So, and more than that, God didn't want to just be present. He wanted to lead the people by his presence. He knew where he was going, and they didn't, <laughs> you know. And he's going to lead them in the way. And so whenever he moved, the, the cloud came off the tabernacle, and it would move, and then they'd pack up and move with him. And when it stopped, they stopped. They always followed the Lord. They didn't uh, deviate from that. So God wanted to personally lead his people. We see that was threatened when they, when they made the golden calf, but God relented and, and said, I will go with you. But it's not just that. The tabernacle is also the place of sacrifice. See, it, it functions as a mobile temple, in, if you will, in which God receives the sacrifices of his people. And these are necessary precisely because of God's holiness. It was the only means by which God could be approached. So if they tried to approach without the sacrificial system, they would be consumed. Now, there's a lot I could say here about the tabernacle, but uh, we're doing an overview and a narrative, so we're actually going to move on to the temple, because the temple is the permanent structure uh, for the presence of God. And so we see the temple... Uh, 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 built and, and uh, dedicated and we see the in, in 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 1 the, the tabernacle moved into the temple and we're going to read that section it says now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribe the chief fathers of the children of Israel to King Solomon in Jerusalem that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the city of David which is in Zion and what, we, what you know by now is that the essence of this thing is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is where God's presence is in between the, the mercy seat. Remember, the mercy seat covers the Ark, and there is the cherubim, and that's where God is present to his people, in that place. And so the, the significance of this is that the Ark is brought into the temple. It says, Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month, so all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him were, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. And the cherubim spread their two wings over the, and they built two big giant cherubim to stretch out like this uh, from wall to wall. <clears throat> and of course the cherubim were still on the mercy seat. So it says, For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from, out, from outside. In other words, remember, the poles are to be left in place. And they are to this, and there they are, and they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, the two the, the commandments. When the Lord God made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So whether or not Solomon did it exactly right and all of that, uh, the ark was in the temple and so was the Lord in his presence. His presence filled the house. Now, what we're seeing here, then, is the same element of the presence of God. The glory cloud is indicative of God's presence, and once again, the only way to approach is through sacrifice. Remember, it drove them out. 
they, they, the, the cloud was so thick that they, it literally drove them out. It did the same thing for Moses. When the cloud entered into the tabernacle the first time, it said it drove Moses out. You no longer enter like that. You enter by sacrifice into the presence of the Lord. Later, God speaks to Moses from the tabernacle, but uh, once he was in that holy place, you enter in by sacrifice. And so, uh, we see then this is a, a dwelling place for God. Well, this temple that Solomon built that served Israel so well for a while actually becomes so defiled by their idolatry. And their idolatry in the temple is absolutely disgusting. I, I won't describe it, but it, it is just perverse and disgusting, sinful worship. Worship of false gods. It's so reviling that God says, I'm out of here. And remember that the, the glory cloud left the temple. And it goes up on the hill and waits for a while, apparently to see if they even notice. They didn't even notice. And then God just left. I remember uh, uh, my pastor uh, uh, from, from Grants Road Baptist Church preaching a sermon one time. And, and he said, you know, the next guy to go in there knew the glory was gone and said nothing. He said nothing. He didn't come out and say, the glory has departed from us. They just kept on going like nothing had changed. Kind of like Samson. He knew not that the Spirit had left him. Israel did not know that the Spirit of God had left them. That they were no longer enjoying his presence. The high priest would go in and it would be dark. There would be no glory cloud to light his way. What a darkness. What a darkness. Trying to worship in the dark. Well, we see this temple motif begin to develop, this tabernacle temple motif. See, Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, but a second temple was built after Israel returned from exile. And we're going to look at that soon. Uh, but the second time, there is no glory cloud that enters it. So God had departed from his people, and even when he brings them back, he does not return in the same way. And they, there's no mention of the glory cloud returning to the temple and, 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 you know, that came about after the exile. There's no mention of that. But God will return to the temple. The glory, the cloud will return. We see that in Ezekiel. And the, the millennial temple, the, 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 the spirit, the glory cloud returns when Christ comes and fills the temple. The spirit comes with him and we, that there will be a, a, a time in which the temple sits filled with the glory of God again. But that's for the future. But I want you to think about these, these temples and these tabernacles and some of the interesting parallels between them and between the, the beginning of creation and the end of creation. Think about Eden and the New Jerusalem and how they mirror the tabernacle in some ways. You know, it, it's, it's interesting, even though that there's specifically stated that there's no temple in the heavenly city, there is a mirror of what's going on. Revelation 21, 22 says this, But I saw no temple in it, in the New Jerusalem, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the Lord illuminated it. There it is, the, the glory of the Lord. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no, more, no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see the glory present in the end, but there's no temple. You see the, the, uh, uh, the holiness of the new Jerusalem. Well, let's look at some of these parallels, these interesting parallels. First of all, there's a threefold construction to the tabernacle, right? It consists of the outer court, 
the holy place, and the holy of holies, and then everything else. So this is the best way I could draw it. That is to scale. Um, and so this is the outer court where all the, the sacrifices took place. This is where the, the, the bread and the, the candle and all, uh, the, not candle, but the lampstand and all that was. And this is the Holy of Holies. And all of this faced east. You entered in from the east like this. When you're moving this way, you're going away from God. When you're moving this way, you're moving towards God. And so they entered in from the east. And so there's that threefold structure, if you will. You see that in the tabernacle. You see it in the temple. Uh, you see it in the rebuilt temples. You see it in Ezekiel's temple, I believe, if I remember right. And so compare that then with Genesis' uh, description of the garden. The garden is planted in the land of Eden, right? From which flow four rivers, one of which seems to serve as a border between Eden and the land of Havilah, where there's gold and precious stones. Now, think about that. When Cain is driven out to the land of Nod, or wandering, that seems to be outside both, both Eden and Havilah. So, apparently you have Havilah, Eden, and then the garden in Eden. And so, there's a kind of a threefold structure there. And uh, when the, the uh, um, well, I won't get to that, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, think of this. In the Holy of Holies, it's a cube, right? It's, it's 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits. When you see the New Jerusalem coming down, it's described what seems to be a cube. In other words, we're all going to live in the holy place with God. That's where we're headed into the Holy of Holies to live eternally with God, to be present with Him. And His glory, will, there's no need for light because, uh, you know, sun and the moon, because His glory will be our light. Are y'all following this? Y'all tracking with me? Isn't that cool stuff? No? Well, think about this. After the fall, the garden was guarded by cherubim, and the mercy seat is guarded by the sculpted cherubim. I mentioned uh, the rivers and the gold, the precious stones. Well, Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and, and the onyx stone are there. So get that. A river flows out from Eden. Well, a river flows out from the temple described by Ezekiel. A river flows out of the throne of God in the New Jerusalem. And so there's this idea of this river flowing, this river of life. And in fact, Psalm 46, 4 says, There's a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. So that even there, the tabernacle is associated with a river. Now, also, why does it mention the gold and the stones in, in Havilah and the surrounding area? Why mention that? Well, to let you know it's precious, it's beautiful, or maybe to point to the tabernacle. What's the tabernacle built out of? Precious stones, uh, you know, gold, silver, all this stuff, a few little things that are kind of weird like badger skins. <laughs> but that's just to keep the water out, right, you know? And God's got to be practical. But it's beautiful. You know, I used to think that it was kind of ugly on the outside. But I'm just thinking of the tabernacle. Uh, I mean, the, 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 you know, the tabernacle actual, not the outer court. The outer court had silver and gold and all that stuff to hold it all together. It was beautiful, too. So it's beautiful inside and out. God is a master craftsman, and he created a, a very beautiful sanctuary. Now, interestingly enough, this idea of this temple tabernacle isn't just a place for God to sit and meet with people. He's, he's to lead them, but he's also, in some sense, a king. He is ruling from the tabernacle. He is ruling from the temple. Psalm 11.4 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. And remember when God uh, tells Samuel, 
And when they're asking, when Israel's clamoring for a king, we want a king, we want a king. And God says, uh, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me as their king. Well, that's because he was ruling over them from the tabernacle. He's their king in their midst. There's some, some pointing here to the kingdom of God. That, that idea keeps developing more and more as we go through the scriptures. Now, what's the importance of the tabernacle? I mean, we've already seen it's the presence of God, right? Exodus 29, verse 45 through 46, God says, I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the, I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. God's point is to dwell among them. And what does it say in the last chapter of Revelation? And God will what? Dwell among men. Isn't that awesome? We all think we're going to get, you know, we're all going to fly away. I'll fly away. And, and we, you know, got this idea of pie in the sky and it's all up there. Actually, it's all coming to here. And it's a new creation, but nevertheless, it's going to be God coming to dwell with us. Coming to be present to us. That's amazing. Or Leviticus 26, 11. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and, sh and you shall be my people. <laughs> that almost sounds passive-aggressive. My, my soul shall not abhor you. In other words, because of his holiness, and because of our sin, God's natural inclination would be to abhor us. But because of redemption, because of what he's done, he is able to, to not only uh, tolerate us, but to do good, to love us, to cherish us, to rejoice over us with singing, as Zephaniah says. Now, it, the tabernacle, this, you know, one, of the, one of these important aspects is that it serves as a dwelling place of God's presence, and that necessitates holiness, so the people must be holy before the Lord. Because Deuteronomy 23, 14 says, For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp, to deliver you and give you your enemies over, and give your enemies over to you. Therefore, your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. Boy, that's a scary thought, isn't it? Israel could, if they defiled the camp, and God is moving in their midst. He's not, you know, he didn't always just stay in the in the tent. He came out for a visit every once in a while, apparently, and. And, and especially when he moved and, and they had to follow. And if he saw unclean things, he would have to turn away. Now, that's, that's God's self-restraint, that he not break out against them to destroy them. So the tabernacle itself serves to bring them in a state of holiness so that, that they can go with God, so that they're able to follow him. And this is done through the sacrifices, but it's also done through the, the law itself and the, the, the ritual cleansing, the, the laws against you know, sexual immorality and all these things that they had that kept them pure. So remember, the law didn't come to get them out of Egypt, right? It didn't, uh, and they didn't get out of Egypt because they had the law. They got the law after they got out of Egypt, after their redemption. The law came to give them the means to walk with God in holiness, to be his special treasure, not to be cast off by God. It wasn't never a, a means of deliverance. It was never meant for salvation. It was always meant for purification, for sanctification, for, for making them suitable to be in God's presence. But also, it's not just the tabernacle is not just important because of the presence of God. It's important because it's a foreshadow. Now, when I first envisioned this sermon, this was what it was all about. <laughs> and you're, you're going to get it in 30 seconds or less. But uh, the, the tabernacle serves as a foreshadow of things to come. See, it is in essence a picture of the ministry of Christ. His death, his sacrificial offering, his intercession as high priest. All these things point to Jesus. The sacrifices, 
there's a lot of material out there that you can, you can look into that will direct you on, on how these things reflect Christ. I mean, obviously his death, you know, the death of the animals, the blood, uh, his blood. Uh, you know, all these things point to who Christ is and the work that he would do. And there is much to be said about that, and it's way beyond what we're able to cover in an overview. And, and so I decided to just leave it at that, because it means getting ahead of where we're going in our narrative. I remember, we're trying to read the story with fresh eyes. We're trying to see it as they saw it, coming at them, not, you know, we're going to start at the end and read it from the, you know, read that into the beginning. We're trying to avoid that if we can. I've done it a little bit, but, but too often, people take the New Testament and then put it, you know, apply it to the Old Testament and then change what the Old Testament was about and try to change its meaning because of something they read in the New Testament. So they're interpreting the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament by virtue of the New Testament. That's backwards. We understand the New Testament in light of the Old Testament. Now that sheds light. It kind of goes backwards too. But, you know, we get more and more light. But nothing in the New Testament changes what the Old Testament said or did. I mean, the New Covenant doesn't change the Old Testament because the Old Testament prophesied the New Covenant. So it doesn't change God's plan. It doesn't change. That's why the covenants are so important. They seal the plan. God, by oath, seals it. And we can't look at parallels and, and all this stuff and then go and change the meaning of the Old Testament as if God's a liar. You know, God promised the land to Israel. They're going to get the land. He's not a liar. He swore by oath. He even promised the land itself that it would blossom under Israel. And so we've we got to stick to the words of God. But that being, being said, we do see Christ in the sanctuary. We do see Christ in the tabernacle. And when we get to Christ, a lot of things make a lot more sense. That didn't make a lot of sense. So we have insight, but it doesn't change the covenants. It doesn't change what was written, unless it says that there was going to be a change, as with the Mosaic Law. So what then do we make of these parallels between Eden and the tabernacle? You know, a lot is made these days about the cosmic temple and all this stuff. And a lot of what is people use these, these parallels for and these types, uh, they use to argue that basically the church has replaced Israel, it's over for them, you know, and, and we're the new temple and blah, blah, blah. There's some truths in that, but not the replacement idea. And, and so, what is really going on here? Well, Hindenberry came up with something that I hadn't ever considered before. And so far, I think it's very promising as to understand what was going on. To me, it makes total sense. Rather than seeing the garden as a prototype of future temples, uh, he says that the tabernacle and also the temple are designed as reminders of what man has fallen from. And I kind of had that idea in my head, I guess, but never just really brought it out that way. So the tabernacle doesn't resemble the original garden near as much as it does the garden after the fall with its flaming sword-bearing cherubim that kept man from entering in. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, a parallel to the mercy seat, which keeps men from uh, violating the Holy of Holies. Think about that. You know, this, there's a veil keeping you out of the Holy of Holies. There's a barrier to God's presence now that barrier, that veil is ripped at the, at the death of Christ and, and at that point we enter into God's presence through Him. Uh, but there's something else going on here rather than few, a, uh, looking forward to the tabernacle in the garden. I think the tabernacle is looking back at the garden and saying, look how we blew it. Look at what we lost. We had direct fellowship with God in the garden and now we have a veil between us that only the high priest can pass through and that was sacrifice. It's a reminder of the fallenness of man. It's a picture of our fallenness. And so, yes, there's a parallel between the tabernacle and Eden. But that parallel is a way of, uh, it's basically a memorial, a reminder. 
Now, I think supporting this view is that the tabernacle itself was never said to be patterned after the garden. In fact, it's specifically patterned after what? The heavenly tabernacle. Ezekiel, uh, uh, Exodus 25, 8. And let them make me, God, a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So what pattern did he show him? Where did he get the pattern from? Well, Hebrews tells us. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we were saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So there's apparently a tabernacle in the heavens that this tabernacle is modeled after. So the tabernacle reminds Israel that while God is present in their midst, they do not have an intimate relationship with Him to His presence, that is, as was experienced in the garden. They, they're cut off. And, and this tabernacle is a preview of a remembrance of that, but it's also a preview of what is to come and the rending of the veil and the entrance into the very presence of God. Well, how do we apply this? We need, to re we need to understand that this reminds us we are separated from God by sin. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear you. God says that to Israel. Or Isaiah says that to Israel. It's because of sin. I, I listened to a debate one time between an atheist and a, and a Christian, and the atheist had one good argument. If there's a God, why are we debating it? Well, the Bible has one good answer. Because His face is hidden from you because of your sins. That's why God is not readily evident to everybody. Everybody knows He's there, but we don't see Him walking around and all that stuff. God has hidden His face from us because of sin. And only in Christ do we enter back into the presence of God. It's only through His death, His resurrection, and His intercession for us that we can one day see God face to face, to be in His very presence and communicate with Him just as Moses communicated with Him, face to face. Remember? Oh, we are separated by sin because what? God is holy. This is a hard sermon for me this week. <laughs> Oh, oh, Lord, examine me. What am I not holy? Oh, man. You know? What does that mean in our context? In what ways do we defile ourselves? You know, that song we were singing a while ago, set no evil thing before our eyes. You know, how, how often do we defile ourselves with something we maybe shouldn't watch? Even if it's just a commercial. Sometimes just the commercials are defiling, right? Well, I always talk about that in Sunday school. God is holy. Listen to what happens when you don't respect that. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant. They were bringing it, how? On a cart. Uzzah put out his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. He's doing a good thing. He's going to hold it. It's not going to hit the ground. Guess what? The ground is more holy than Uzzah. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. The ground had never rebelled against God, but Uzzah had. And he did not follow it according to the pattern. How were they supposed to move it? With the rods. 
and with the family that was des- uh, uh, assigned to the moving. I forgot the, which family it was that had to move it, but one of them had to move it. They, only they could carry it. And so when it fell and he thought he was doing a good thing, it cost him his life because God is holy and God broke out against him. There's a proper way to move the ark, and Israel had violated it. The wrath of God breaks forth when His holiness is threatened. Consider two more examples. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part of it, a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. God is a holy God. And Ananias and his wife threatened the holiness of God. They were lying in the church, using God to build up their own reputations with deception and lies. And God gives us an example that even under the covenant of grace, the, the new covenant, the, the covenant that Jesus said, you can still die at the hands of God's holiness if you threaten His holiness. Now, there's another example we're going to talk about in just a minute when we get to the Lord's table, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Guys, what this all means is we must be holy. 1 Peter 1.13 Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. God has called us to holiness, not uncleanness, not filth, not all the garbage that the world's engaged in. Now, we're still in the world. He's not called us out of the world. But we are to be sanctified even in the world. Set apart for Him. And it's a dangerous thing not to be. Sometimes we wonder why things go wrong. It's just possible. It's just possible that maybe we had defiled the holiness of God. Usually, though, that's not just going to be in our little daily lives. It's going to be in something in relation to the church or, or as a body, as a group of believers. It's going to be something that's going to bring a, a dark a blot on God's name in relation to his reputation. God will guard his holiness even against us. Even though he loves us, he is gar- going to guard his holiness against us. When we come to the Lord's table, we need to remind, be reminded that God will guard His holiness. I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world." Therefore, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. They were drunk 
at the Lord's table. They were doing all kinds of stupid stuff, selfish. And Paul says, you know what? You have violated the holiness of God. You're not discerning the Lord's body, and you're bringing judgment on yourselves as a body. As a group of Christians, you're weak. Many of you are dying. You're sick because of the way you're doing the Lord's Supper, the way that you are coming to this table in an unworthy manner. Examine yourselves to make sure that you're coming with a right, ha- a right heart, a right attitude, not out of selfishness, not in a, an unholy manner. And I think it also helps if we take a moment and consider our, our walk with God in that time. It's not what the text is ultimately about but it is definitely something that's conducive to coming in a right manner, to examine our hearts before Him, to make sure that we are seeking Him and seeking His holiness and purity and His fellowship and His presence at the table. So let's pray. Father, we come to You. We thank You for the opportunity to gather together in Your presence. We know that you are present to us when we gather together at your table. We know that Jesus is always present with us, Lord, but we know that there is a unique presence for us with you at this fellowship meal. And I pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord, to really understand the significance of that. That, Father, that we would not come in an unworthy manner that we would come before you with right hearts Lord that we would examine ourselves first and Father I pray that we would have this time uh, right now just to take a moment to reflect on our attitude as we come to your table reflect on our hearts and and the, and the, the conduct of our walk before you as we come before this table Lord that we not dishonor you that we not defile you. And so we just take this time, Lord. And so we just take this time, Lord.